Hi class, this is Professor Hinderocker, and this week we're not going to have an overview video. It's pretty self-explanatory. What we need to do for week three, we're going to read chapter six, take our quiz, and then complete cap three. So instead, we're going to go over cap three uh, through the five kinematic variables that relate to your chosen movement. And I'm going to explain this uh, excitement a little bit more to you so you have a better understanding of what is expected of you. So you're going to pull up this document, it's listed under CAP 3, and I've made quite a few notes on it that aren't listed in the original document, so you will want to come back and look at this video probably several times to make sure that you are completing this assignment appropriately. So for this assignment, you're going to film a volunteer correctly performing your chosen movement. During the video, as your volunteer is performing the movement, discuss how each of the five kinematic variables relate to your chosen movement. See video guidelines at the bottom of the document. So we have our are five kinematic variables. I'd like to make a note here. I realize that some of us may not have a volunteer available to us this week. And so if you can only use yourself to, to be the example, that's okay. As long as you're discussing in the video the timing, position, and location, displacement, velocity, and acceleration. So you need to be able to correctly identify all five kinematic variables, do the work accordingly, and uh, you also need to be able to film yourself accordingly. So you can use a selfie stick, you can prop your phone up on uh, some books against a shoe, you can have somebody else video, that would probably be the best option is for somebody else to video you unless you have a tripod, but I need to be able to see your entire body in this video as well as your volunteers. Like I said before, if you don't have a volunteer, it's okay if you use yourself, but it would be great if you did have a volunteer. Okay, so something important to note here is we're going to be measuring only the concentric phase of your exercise this week. And the first kinematic variable is our timing. We measure timing in seconds. So you're going to analyze and explain the time seconds needed to complete your chosen movement. One repetition and the completion of the movement. So here are your movements. I listed them all down here. And I'm going to use the deadlift as my example today. So when I am measuring my timing, when I'm taking my seconds for my deadlift, I'm going to measure from the time that I hold onto the barbell on the floor to when I'm completely standing. So when I completely extend at the knee and the hip. Okay, so let's say that I'm bent over and I'm holding my bar. I click the start button and I come all the way up, fully extending at the knee and the hip through the concentric phase. And then I click stop as soon as I'm completely extended and standing straight up. Let's say it took me two seconds. So I would have, let's see if I can get my mouse to work. I would have two seconds written down as my timing. Okay. Moving on, position or location. Verbally explain the anatomical posi positions of each major joint during the start, middle, and end of your movement while your volunteer performs. Describe the joint action and plane of movement at each point. So this is what we did last week in CAP 2. So you need to go back in CAP 2, look at your planes of motion, uh, look at any of the feedback that I've given you that will all be back to you by Wednesday. So if you want to hold off on making this video until Wednesday or Thursday, you should have all that information back to make sure that you get it correctly on this video. But you're going to be going through each joint, the anatomical position of the joint and the plane of motion. So for my deadlift, I am extending. So I'm we're going to go through ankle, knee, hip, and spine. So I'm plantar flexing on my ankle as I, as I extend and come up, plantar flexing. My knee and my hip are extending, and my spine is in a neutral position, okay? And I'm, I am finished. I'm going to also tell you what plane of motion I am completing this in, so sagittal, transverse, or frontal plane, okay? And that goes for all of these, barbell overhead press, barbell bench press, pull-up, vertical jump, broad jump, and 40-yard dash. So those three things we're looking for, anatomical position, what's happening in the position, and then your plane of movement. Your third, sorry, your third kinematic variable is displacement. You're going to identify and quantify linear displacement of the body center of gravity or the path of the barbell during your chosen movement. So you're going to measure the displacement in meters. This is very important. Your displacement must be converted to meters no matter how you measure it to begin with. So you're measuring from point A to B of the concentric movement. So again, using the deadlift as my example, I would measure my barbell from where I'm holding the barbell near the floor from the start position to the finished position. So let's say as I lean over, I grab my barbell and my barbell is four inches off of the ground. That's my starting point, so my A. A equals four inches, okay? So I'm gonna write that here. A equals four inches. And then I'm going to fully extend and bring the bar off the ground as I'm standing upright completed in the concentric phase, 
and I'm going to measure from the barbell all the way back down to the ground, and that's going to equal 34 inches, okay? Now I subtract, so it's going to be 34 minus 4 inches equals 30 inches, okay? And then I'm going to go on my Google search, and I'm going to plug in 30 inches and convert that into meters, and then I'll have uh, my answer in meters, okay? And you'll do that for barbell overhead press, barbell bench press, pull up, vertical jump, broad jump, 40 yard dash. You don't have to do it for all of them, just the movement that you are choosing to analyze inside of this course, okay? So 40, 40 yard dash is pretty easy because because it already gives you 40 yards, you just have to convert that into meters. Velocity, identify the speed and direction of your chosen movement in meters over seconds. Combine answers from timing and displacement to calculate velocity. So you're going to take meters from displacement right here. We just finished this. It would be my 30 inches. All right, so 30 inches. And then I'm going to take my time up here, which is two seconds, over two. Okay, so take meters from displacement and divide it by the time it took during the concentric phase, which would equal 15. Okay. Acceleration, describe how you might calculate linear acceleration for your chosen movement. If you had access to the proper equipment, what equipment and data would you need and what formula would you follow to find linear acceleration? So I'm going to give you the formula. I've written it out here for you. Initial velocity is equal to zero, all right? Zero minus the velocity, which is the value from above, 15, divided by the time during the concentric phase. So then I'm going to divide it by my time, which is two, okay? And then it would equal, you can do the math on that. Okay, so it should equal 7.5. And so those are our five kinematic variables, all right? I want you, when you do this assignment, to delete all of this, all right? We don't need to have this there. And then I want you to write the timing of my, my exercise is the deadlift. I measured the barbell, the starting position of the barbell on the floor, to and through the concentric phase so once i'm holding the barbell standing up in extension and then i want you to write the timing okay so it'd be two seconds all right same thing here position and location delete it all write your exercise i am doing the deadlift i'm going to be talking about anatomical position in the ankle knee hip and spine you can make a little chart if you want that might be easier to read ankle is performing plantar flexion in this plane of motion, knee is performing extension, hip is performing extension, spine is in a neutral position, and then write their uh, plane of motion as well next to them. Displacement, I want you to write out exactly what I did here. So give your, uh, what you measured. So give it in inches or feet or whatever you're measuring and then convert it into meters. So I didn't complete this, but then you can say converted into meters. Not an addition sign, and then you'd write whatever that is in meters. Velocity, same thing, just like I showed you down here. And acceleration, same thing like I showed you down here. And then very lastly, you're going to identify the lever system at work in your chosen movement. So this activity at each major joint. For each lever, identify the anatomical fulcrum axis. So A is your, your axis, uh, R is your resistance force, and F is your muscular effort force. So we went over this in Chapter 6. Make sure that you read that portion of the text before you finish this portion of the cap. But for, for an example, we're going to use the bicep curl, which is a third class lever. So the axis point is the elbow joint, all right? That's where the axis is. The resistance is the dumbbell that you're holding in your hand, okay? It's a weight that you're holding, you're having to resist against. And the force is the biceps brachii, and this is a pull. So you're pulling the dumbbell up towards your shoulder to create, to finish a, a bicep curl. And this is a third class lever. And typically, if the movement you're performing is a pull, it's a third-class lever. If it's a push, it's a, it's a, a first-class lever, okay? So third-class pull, first-class push. This isn't always correct, but typically it is correct. And second-class levers are not very typical to come across. However, they do occur in certain movements. So a hint, an example would be a vertical jump. So a first class, a second class lever, I'm sorry, is seen in a calf raise or a push up. So you may see a second class lever in something like your vertical jump, where we're flexing with our foot and with our calves and plantar flexion. All right. 
So real quick, your video guidelines, you and your volunteer must appear together in full frame on the onset of the video. You have to talk during this video. I want you to coach your volunteer through the movement. I want to see that you're taking the time. I want to see that you're measuring with a ruler or you're measuring with a tape measure. A tape measure would be probably most effective uh, for the displacement. Introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is, so if it was my my video that I was making. Hi, my name is Victoria Hinderocker and this is my volunteer, Tyler Hinderocker. And then you're going to describe the movement that will be performed. Okay, so I'm going to perform the deadlift today with my volunteer, Tyler. He's going to perform the deadlift and I'm going to coach him through it as well as taking the timing, displacement, and so on and so forth. Dress professionally. This doesn't mean you have to wear slacks and a button down or a dress. It just means you need to wear work at attire. So don't wear ripped jeans. Uh, wear something that is conducive to what you're filming. So for the ladies, wear uh, appropriate modest shorts and a t-shirt. For gentlemen, appropriate shorts and a t-shirt or a tank top, whatever you most prefer is fine. Athletic shoes, I don't want to see sandals, those types of things. Interact with your volunteer in a professional and clinical manner. So this is a big one. I've been pretty lenient on some of our videos in CAP 1. However, we need to really make sure that we're being professional. You guys are in college, so just a friendly reminder, you're not supposed to be joking around with your volunteer during this video. They are your volunteer and this is for a grade. If your volunteer is laughing and you're joking around and people are yelling and it's noisy, that's not, this is not a professional, it wouldn't be considered a professional video, okay? Uh, I want you to interact professionally with your volunteer in the sense of, you know, if I was talking to Tyler, Tyler, can you please lift the bar up for me starting in three, two, one, or explaining to them what they're going to do. Tyler, now I'm going to measure the distance from the bar on the ground to when you stand up in the concentric phase. So what you're going to do first is you're just going to stand here and hold the bar, and I'm going to measure the distance. And then you measure. Great, that's four inches. Now, can you please fully extend and come up to a standing position? He'll fully extend and come up to a standing position. Now, Tyler, I'm going to measure the distance from the barbell to the ground with you standing up. That's 34 inches. Explain what you're doing to your volunteer. If you can explain it to somebody, then you'll better understand it. The fifth thing, film your volunteer performing the movement using your cell phone or an other HD camera. If you're using a cell phone, it must be in landscape mode. So I also wrote that down here. Uh, you have to have it in landscape mode because if it's not in landscape mode, then I will not be able to see it well on YouTube. It will be grainy and fuzzy, and then I won't be able to really give you a great grade because I won't be able to see what you're doing. So make sure that it's in landscape mode and that I can see your whole body and their whole body. Six, use anatomical terminology in all descriptions of movement. So I don't want to hear you say, okay, now stand up. Great job. Nice job through this phase of motion. I want to hear, we're going to be per performing the deadlift, and I'm going to be describing what's hap happening at each major joint, so the ankle, the knee, the hip, and the spine. As my participant stands up, the ankle is performing plantar flexion, the knee is performing extension, the hip is performing extension, and the spine is in a neutral position. We complete all of this through the concentric phase from point A to B, and then you're going to tell me uh, the plane of motion, whether it's uh, sagittal, transverse, or frontal plane, okay? Be sure that the movement is clearly visible from appropriate angles. So Videotape from a couple different angles. If you have a third participant who's willing to videotape you, that is wonderful. Have them videotape you straight on. Have them videotape you from the side so that I can see how your individual is performing the movement, so that I can see you coaching the individual through the movement. It's a lot easier for you to see what's going on in the movement because you're standing right there with an actual human being. It's a little bit more difficult for me as your uh, professor to see exactly what you're doing because I'm only seeing it from one angle typically. So I would love to see it from at least two angles, whether it's from the side and in front, whether it's from the front and in back, but show me two angles, okay? Be sure your video has appropriate audio so that you can be clearly heard. Do not film in a noisy gym. So a lot of times the temptation is to go to the gym because they have all the equipment there. Yes, you need equipment for this. Um, I understand if you don't own a rack. I don't own a rack at home. So make sure that you are if you're going to the gym, you're in a quiet room or you're in a large studio room and you bring a small barbell in with you and you film that way. If there's some noise in the background, it's okay, but it's a really disruptive noise, you know, people running in and out of houses, slamming doors, uh, being in a gym with really loud music on. That was fine for our first video uh, with those of you who filmed in a gym because you were just filming the movement, but it's not okay for this one because you need to be talking the whole time in this video. And lastly, upload the video to YouTube. Be sure that the video is set to public or unlisted. So public means anyone can see it. Unlisted means that only the people you share the link with can see it.